I'm going to share about the tools that God gives us to create and build unshakable hope in us and also where our focus is on um, for having hope, what we're putting that hope into. Um, yeah, that's what I want to say with that. So Psalm 25 verse 5 um, in your notes says, My hope is in you, Lord, all the day long. And I wanted to start by asking and just highlighting where our focus of hope is in. Um, I think for many of us, we can fall into the trap of putting our hope in God that he'll work a circumstance out in the way that we would like, rather than on a hope that he's going to do something good in us in the middle of that circumstance. Very common mistake. Um, and I'll share about uh, an example I've got of my own life about that a little bit later. But 2 Peter 1 verse 3, also in your notes, really tells us very clearly that the whole reason God gives us his promises and his blessings is for that very reason, is to shape us more into the image of Christ. It says, by his divine power, God has given us everything we need for living a godly life. And because of his glory and excellence, he has given us great and precious promises. These are the promises that enable you to share his divine nature, in, order to become, in other words, become more Christ-like and escape the world's corruption caused by human desires. So we can, of course, ask God for a specific outcome, and often he likes to give us the desires of our heart in that way. But more importantly, he's wanting to grow the character of Christ in us in this situation. I love, it's probably close to one of my favourite verses in Job 13, 15, which says, Even if he slays me and everything dies around me and the whole world falls apart, still I will hope in him. So that's the goal we want to get to. So Pastor Deb started our United service with this whole theme and she drew our attention to the ultimate price people pay when they lose hope that something good can happen either outside themselves or inside themselves and that's suicide. So I looked up the statistics and in 2017, which was the most recent ones I could find, over 3,000 people in Australia died through intentional self-harm and three times or three, three times... Males were three times more highly represented in that number than females. That's a lot of people who have found that they just can't find hope or hold on to hope anymore. So I recently read a biography of Nick Trainer, who was written by his mum, Danielle Steele. Does anyone know Danielle Steele? Yeah, the famous fiction author. But this was a work of non-fiction. Her son, Nick, um, it do documented the life of her son, Nick, who suicided at the age of 19 after he lost either the capacity or and the desire to hold on to hope. So I want to differentiate between those two things because they're both different. One is about ability, so capacity is about the ability to hold on to hope, but the other is about a willingness and a choice to hold on to hope. The old me would have said once upon a time that everyone has the ability to hold on to hope. It's a choice. Well, everyone has that choice to be able to make. But now I'm, I couldn't say that with any degree of conviction. After working in the field of mental illness now, I was just thinking I've been doing that for nine years now, so time's crept away, um, and living with intellectual disability in our home, I'm not sure that some people are able to choose hope. And then I thought, well, then how can they be held accountable for taking their lives? Are they held accountable for taking their lives? These were quick God questions. You know, the day you get to heaven... <laughs> I'm adding them to my list. Um, because in reading the biography of Nick, um, looking in from the outside, but also catching a little bit of understanding of the biological pressures he was under, together with all the dark thoughts he wrestled with in the journal entries that his mum included in her book, all I know that that's a really hard thing to determine, whether someone's able to choose hope, um, although I know that God can look in the heart and decide that for himself. So Nick was the fourth of nine children that Danielle raised. She had seven of her own, has seven of her own, and two stepchildren. And unlike one might perhaps jump to the conclusion of, knowing that she's a famous author, fame and riches did not mean that she left her children in full-time care of nannies or boarding schools so that she could just get on with her writing career and be famous. Instead, she would only write in the late hours of the night and into the early hours of the morning while they slept. She describes the early years of her second natural child, Nick, as being extraordinary and exhibiting key signs of the mental illness of manic bipolar. So that's where you have very um, extreme mood swings between euphoria and depression, and you also have a lot of delusional thinking. But the signs of that in the 1980s were still largely unrecognised. 
He was, she said, unusually intelligent and extremely advanced. She describes him as being different from other people's children, smarter, brighter, faster, had more energy than any child she'd ever seen and had a way of looking at her that made her feel he was a grown man in a small child's body. Medications had the reverse reactions on him than prescribed, which is another symptom of manic bipolar. Drugs to make him sleep, in her words, turned him into a whirling dervish right in front of me. He would go 150 miles per hour, which was a paradoxical reaction, whereas coffee would put him to sleep. He had a strong personality and extremely definite ideas, especially about what he would or wouldn't wear. Danielle documents many arguments throughout his whole childhood and early teens over what she felt was appropriate attire for any given occasion. And he also hardly slept. Long before he was two, she realised she couldn't give him a nap. Manic depressives find it extremely difficult to sleep for any decent length of time at night. And this was the bane of his existence for the whole of his life. But at a young age, no one picked up that it was anything unusual. He needed incredibly little sleep. He went to sleep after she went to bed and was awake before dawn. He took his first steps at eight months, and by the time he was one year old, he was speaking in sentences and was verbal enough to discuss and dictate his first birthday plans to her. She said she remembers having an argument about what music would be played at his first birthday party with him. By the time he was two, he was articulate in both Spanish and English. He had very definite ideas when he was two and a half. If he didn't want to do anything, he would get belligerent, angry and stubborn. It made it difficult to take him places even at that age because if he didn't like what was happening, he made her life a living hell. And it was easy to assume, well, he was just a spoiled child of a rich, a spoiled child of a rich parent, but she had a gnawing feeling of sickness that he wasn't as normal as she wanted him to be. Looking back, she says, it was as though there was a pain raging inside him. So like this, this biological... This biological stumbling block in him that he had to work with, that he had to contend with, that many of us never have had to even experience. A pain he did not know how to soothe or handle. He was not an easy child to love or manage. She knew at four and even more so at five that there was something wrong with him, but she didn't know how to put words to it. And whenever she did to both friends and psychiatrists, she felt no one would listen to her. He began to unravel at age 11. He was harder to control, harder to handle, destructive. His rages got worse, became more obsessive over different things in his life. Life was a blur of expulsions, sourcing different schools, institutions and camps to contain him. She even used to pay for 24-7 carers to be on site with him so that they could manage his behaviour. Right up until the age of 17 when he had a little bit of a respite when lithium was finally prescribed for him and she said he became a changed person. Happy, good-humoured, sane, well-balanced, calm and getting A's in school. The problem, though, is that usually at some point many manic depressives went on lithium will believe, oh, I'm better now, and they take themselves off the pills, which is what started happening with Nick until he succeeded at his fourth attempt to suicide at the age of 19 in 1997. Danielle wrote, Two things come to mind as I read Nick's journals today. One is that he was sick. He had a rampaging disease that was beginning to control him. He was a good kid with a bad disease. And so often kids like that and people like that are treated as bad and punished for what they can't help. I fought desperately for Nick. I never wanted him to be punished for being sick. It wasn't his fault. It was my responsibility and one I refused to turn my back on for his entire life. I hated the places that shut these people away removed them from sight, punished them for their peculiarities and proved to them that no one loved them after all. I always believed that loving Nicky enough would make a difference or help or maybe even cure him. It didn't cure him, perhaps, but never for a single instant of his life did he ever doubt that he was loved. That was my gift to him, the only gift I really had to give him. And my heart broke for her as I read about the effort and attempts she made to keep him safe and it so reminded me of the love of God shining through her, totally accepting, non-judgmental, forgiving, persevering. She never gave up on him no matter how hopeless the situation seemed, no matter how many stressful outcomes presented themselves. So is Nick someone with manic bipolar? Is someone who has an intellectual disability? Is someone who's broken by circumstances in life that have been out of their control, ever not able to choose to desire something good to happen in the future? either inside or outside of themselves. Isn't it good we've got a supernatural God who can break through those barriers? Able or not, however, pursuing hope in life, expecting good things in God to happen in us, is exactly what God tells us we're to do. It's not a passive condition that will just miraculously settle in our lives. 
We have to choose to pursue hope and reach for it in practical ways. If hope in God means to put our focus on the good, changing work that Jesus is always wanting to do in us, then there's some verses that I've got printed out for you that tell us of our responsibility to stay close to God and pursue him. Remember that Jesus in John, it says, in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. So when it says the word, we can just replace the word for that with God. So it says in Deuteronomy 30, choose life, choose God and not death. Choose life so that you and your children may live. We've come to share in Christ if we, if we hold firmly till the end the confidence we had at first. Watch out that you do not lose what you have worked for. You must hold tightly to the truth. Hold tightly to Jesus. Guard well the God-given ability you received as a gift from the Holy Spirit. Keep watch over yourselves. Be careful and watch yourself close, closely so that you do not forget the things your eyes have seen or let them slip from your heart. Work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Trembling, I will always remind you of these things, even though you know them and are firmly established in the truth. It is right to refresh your memory. And when my soul is in the dumps, I will rehearse everything I know of you. So there's lots of scripture that puts that responsibility on us to stay close to God and to build that hope. While Nick's life was the life of a young man who seemed unable to make these choices, to hold on to hope, Maybe because of the disease in his body, maybe because no one told him about the choices for life that God had given him. The Israelites in the Old Testament, on the other hand, were an example of a whole people group who were very well aware of life and truth, had experienced the faithfulness, love and character of their God, who were clearly warned to hold tight to God, to hold close to the good hope he had for them, warned of the consequences if they didn't, and yet they still chose death. So I've got some more scriptures here, which is it's just so clear from God what he wanted from them. <laughs> Deuteronomy 11, it's recorded what they were instructed to do to hold on to God for their hope. Fix these words of mine. Fix me, God, in your hearts and minds. Tie my words as symbols on your hands. Bind them on your foreheads. Teach me to your children, talking about me when you sit at home, when you walk along the road, when you lie down, when you get up. Write my words on the door frames of your houses and on your gates, so that your days and the days of your children may be many in the land, as many as the days that the heavens are above the earth. What I'm commanding you today is not too difficult for you or beyond your reach. See, I've set before you today life and prosperity or death and destruction. For I command you today to love me, to walk in obedience to me, keep my commands, decrees and laws, and then you will live and increase and I will bless you. But if your heart turns away and you are not obedient... And if you are drawn away to bow down to other gods and worship them, I declare to you this day you will be destroyed. You will not live long in the land you are crossing the Jordan to enter and possess. So Moses wrote down the law, gave it to the priests and to the elders and commanded them, at the end of every seven years when everyone comes together to appear before the Lord your God, you will read this law before them. Assemble the people so they can listen and learn to fear the Lord your God and follow carefully all the words of this law. Their children who do not know this law must hear it and learn to fear the Lord your God as long as you live in the land you are crossing the Jordan to possess. But then the Lord said to Moses privately, You are now going to rest with your ancestors, but these people, I'm letting you know right now, are soon going to prostitute themselves to the foreign guards of the lands they are entering. They will forsake me and break the covenant I made with them, and in that day I will become angry with them and forsake them. I will hide my face from them, and they will be destroyed. Many disasters and calamities will come on them. How is it that the Israelites and us today keep forgetting the lesson to stay close to pursue God? In order to remain confident of his good plans for us, we have to fan into flame that living, vibrant, full personal relationship with him. Because the fall away from hope is slow and insidious. It's like being white anted out. Conversations about God become about but with each other become less. Time becomes too busy to spend regularly meeting together or worshipping. Things get in the way of taking out God's word and reading it every day. Life looks and seems normal, just like the house wall, until pressure comes, and then suddenly our hope goes straight through the wall, which has slowly been white anted, eaten away, by not drawing close to God and his word. We think, yeah, I know God's word, I know the stories, I'm staying in touch, I get to church every three weeks, it's pretty good. But how much are you pushing forward, breaking new ground, seeking to be closer? Or how much are you just coasting along on same old, same old? Because we all know that if you're not putting effort into a relationship, it's going backwards. 
distance from God and spiritual death remain a consequence for us today. It's not just the Old Testament stuff and possibly even physical death for someone like Nick when we let go of the hope that we have in God. It is up to us to choose it. But for those who don't, whether it's someone like Nick or someone like the Israelites, it's up to God to know why and provide the appropriate consequences. All I know is God looks into each one of our hearts and he isn't fooled. So what are the tools that we are to choose to pick up and pursue? Well, Max Licardo mentioned in week two's DVD that simply put their prayer, worship and the word. And in the readings that we went through this morning, we can see that it's that regular refreshing of reading God's word, obedience to it, the testimony and teaching of it from one generation to the next, the regular gathering together of like-hearted people that all help towards holding on to and building hope, a confident expectation of good things of being made into God's image. So I'll ask you the question this morning, how are you going at writing down God's word? What are the doorposts in your life that you're fixing God's word to? What bathroom mirror are you using? What toilet door? What routines do you have established for gathering with your children, grandchildren, mentorees and teaching them God's word? What plan times do you have to gather together with other believers and worship? What strategies do you have for regular prayer and the rehearsal of God's lessons in your life or the regular listening to and reading of his word? And most importantly, how are you going at obeying what you read? Falling into the trap of tying our hope to outcomes and circumstances rather than outcomes within ourselves, as I said, is an easy thing to do. And I've just realised very recently that for many years I fell into the trap of hoping for a specific outcome in God in our personal family situation, more than having my hope in the changes God was making in me as I encountered the situation. God had given me an analogy many years ago that he was giving me a Moses task of leading a certain person out of life, out of a life of the slavery of her situation, from the poverty of no family, no material possessions, no spiritual inheritance, into a promised land of a family, physical safety and his spiritual kingdom, and who I assumed would be able to manage to sustain these gains independently. I had a desire that God would give me someone who had no home of their own, who would have, without a doubt, ended up living on the streets and use our family to transform her life. And after 15 years of doing this, oh, I had no understanding, though, of how hard this journey would be. Probably, I'm thinking, mainly because it also included an intellectual disability. And after 15 years, all I'm going to say, it was so hard. i leave it there, because if I get started, you're going to never stop me. <laughs> But after 15 years of doing this, when that journey came to a semi-close as this person physically moved on and left our home, I felt no sense of closure because amongst several reasons, I couldn't see in her that fully developed, independent, self-directed life of freedom and permanent stability in the new ways of living in God's kingdom in her. I didn't feel I'd achieved and hadn't felt for many years that I was succeeding at instilling, instilling wisdom in her that would assess the circumstance understand the consequences, make a choice for the good outcome. Her intellectual disability, a little bit like Nick, meant that she was a person who seemingly would more than likely never be able to progress much beyond the intellectual understanding and independence of perhaps a 10-year-old. And she will always be someone who will need much scaffolding and support, guidance and advice, and who even with all the support and all the running around I would try to do and plug all the gaps, would frequently find a way to do life her own way, even as recently as last weekend when we nearly had police involved in a situation she got herself into. So I felt like my initial hope was lost, the lost hope that I hadn't done what I'd set out to do, the lost hope that I hadn't achieved even what I thought God wanted me to do. All my hope was focused on the details of the outcome rather than on what God had done in me and in her through the journey to make us both more like him and is still continuing to do. So while I was mulling with God about what my sense of no closure was about, the Holy Spirit prompted me to go back to my Moses picture again and consider how he too might have felt that he'd had no real closure or perhaps success in his practical journey. So I'd always just assume that Moses had succeeded in his goal or the goal that God had given him. He led the Israelites out of slavery in Egypt and into the Promised Land, a wonderful country of their own. And in one real sense, of course, the Israelites did make it to Canaan eventually. And in one sense, the young woman in my home has made it safely through to exiting our home, as all responsible, independent children should do, into adulthood, still safe in God's kingdom, not on the streets. Tick, tick, tick. 
But when I stopped and actually had a good think about Moses, I realised that the first group he rescued all died in the desert. Every second, every, every one of them. Then after he hung around for 40 more years, he didn't even get to go into the new country with the next lot. And moreover, before he, well, before he actually died, God says, oh, and by the way, this next lot that you've waited around to get in the thing, they're all going to turn their backs on me anyway and they're not going to follow either. They'd be, I'd be thinking... What was the point of all that, God? What was all that about? You know, because if that was the outcome, it didn't look like it had happened. Especially when the people that he'd worked with so hard wouldn't be able to sustain remaining at the distance that he'd helped them support to cover so far. Hello. But it wasn't about the natural outcome. It was about Moses being obedient, being faithful to trust and persevere in the most difficult of circumstances to trust and obey, to believe God's promises when nothing seemed to make sense, when in the natural everything looked the opposite of what you thought it should be looking like. He trusted in God's character, God's plan, God's promises, and he filled God's assignment for that season of his life. And I realised that that's what I'd done too. Closure or having fulfilled hope wasn't about my perspective or understanding of the goal, but about God's transforming work in both of us and our family along the way. Unshakable hope in who God is, having a confident expectation now that God is good and he works for good in me, has grown in me over the past 15 years as I literally got down on my knees day after day and pressed in close to him, seeking God for the fresh word that I needed that day from him to cope with what was happening in my home. The verses that brought me strength and encouragement to continue for just one more day. I had to pursue God for this hope and strength to grow. I had to stay close to and read his word, write reminders of myself, of what he'd told me. I had to talk about these things a lot with my friends and Phil (laughs) and encourage others around me who in their own ways were struggling. I had to stay close to God's family and worship and pray many, many times in between the times I was screaming. I remember early days here when she first arrived, memories of, yes, not good. (laughs) Sometimes we'd find her down at the playground, down the junior school. Everyone would be saying, where's she gone? Where's she gone? Like this, because she was a runner. Um, To learn and trust and have faith in God's ways, even when I couldn't see anything good in the circumstances, I had to stay close and hold on to God to discipline and bring under control my anger and frustration. To practice and let God develop the fruit of the Spirit in me, even when I almost always felt the complete opposite of every single fruit. To rely on him to practice loving, giving, serving when I didn't see any outward good happening. And that's how hope, a transformation from self-focused living towards God-focused living grew in me. And that's how hope, a confident expectation for good, grew. And though even though the external circumstances didn't turn out in the natural as I had envisioned, a confident expectation for good still remains for God's internal and external plans to eventuate for both her and me. Thanks, musicians. Some of you this morning might be feeling a little bit like me, have felt. Tired, despairing of waiting for or hoping for a certain outcome in a situation. Maybe your marriage isn't looking like the marriage you'd hoped it would look like. Maybe your children haven't turned out the way that you were hoping they'd turn out. Maybe your job or your career or your health isn't looking the way that you'd hoped it would be. And all I can do is encourage you this morning to just keep your eyes fixed on God, who he is and what he's wanting to do in you in those circumstances, not on how it's all going to turn out. Not just your eyes, but your hands as you pick up his word, your eyes as you read it, your fingers as you write down your observations, what you'll do to change, your feet as you walk the actions out, your brain as you think about his word, your mouth as you speak it, and your ears as you listen to his word being spoken. I can speak to you as adults because with this young person in my home, I had to think of the plan, write the plan down, put it in front of her, make sure she looked at it every day to try and hold her continually to God's way of doing life. But you're adults. I can say, make your own plan. Be adults. Leave this room today and do something smart, which is that goal. Specific, measurable, achievable. Ah, I don't even get, don't worry about it. Yeah, what does that mean? Of course it's realistic. I suppose it's going to be realistic. T, timely, that you can measure it. Go away and just check. Like some of you might think, yeah, I've got all that. I've got my times of drawing close to God, reading his word, journaling, gathering with other believers, all, all going well. That's great. Well done. Go. 
if, it, if, you, if you sort of got to tweak a few things, just tweak one thing and make it that smart goal this morning when you leave. Um, I know that as over the years I've developed a plan for quiet time, so every day it's journaling, Bible reading, journaling, prayer, prayer for my family. That's a non-negotiable. Then I have five rolling things that I roll over a five-day plan. So one day I'll pray for a list of unsaved people. Next day I'll do my Bible reading, journaling, pray for my family. I'll pray for my clients. The third day I'll do Bible reading, journaling, pray for my family. I'll pray for the church, the government, and all the other bits and pieces that God tells us to pray for in the Bible. Next day, Bible reading, journaling, family. I'll learn a memory verse and revise some memory verses. And the fifth day, Bible reading, journaling, pray for the family. And then I'll have a book where all the key things that I've learnt, I've put in one book. And I'll just read a paragraph of, because I want to keep remembering, you know those things, those aha moments when you think, oh, that's so helpful, God, I've really got to hang on to that thought. I'll put that in a book. And then on that fifth day, I'll just read the next chunk that I'm up to to remind myself of those lessons. And it's so amazing because I'll often have a client that day or you'll see someone and you think, oh, I'll share this with you. And it's only because I just revised it myself that morning that I could remember it because otherwise it's in one ear and out the other. So that's my plan I have, a specific plan to keep all those balls going. And then I find when I'm sometimes on holidays or life gets busy, that plan goes out the window and I don't follow it. And... Rather than beating myself up with guilt as I used to do, I just think, that's okay, God. This is kind of like my bread and butter diet that I come back to. And in times of maybe great grief or stress, when I don't get to spending that time with him, that kind of carries me through that little bit. And then I come back into and feed regularly when I can make that regular time again. So it's about not beating yourself up to when the plan doesn't work. It's something that you you want to make your bread and butter diet that you come back to all the time. But sometimes you're going to have those other occasions when you skip that. And um, God understands that. He's not going to you know, beat you over the head that you're not sticking to your plan 24-7. But you've got to have a plan. So let's just close in prayer this morning. Father, we just thank you for um, how you partner with us to create unshakable hope in us. It isn't just something you zap into our lives. We actually have to work this out and through us as we follow you. And you've given us these tools to do it, of staying close to your word. You're so clear in your word about how we have to just eat your word every day, ponder it, meditate it, think upon it, obey it, put it into practice. And I thank you for the blessing it is to each and every one of us. I thank you that it's only your word that's held me over the the last 15 years, especially in my particular struggle that I've had in my in my life. Um, I wouldn't have done it without you. It's it's only been you that's carried me, and I give you the glory for that. And thank you for that. And I thank you that the hope and that I have now in your goodness, and the hope that I have in your good plans. It's just 100%. I hope, Lord, unless you show me that it's not. And I, I, show me and grow it, I ask you in Jesus' name. But um, I thank you for that confidence I have now in you that, that nothing, is, nothing comes to me unfiltered by your hand, unfiltered by your love, and that it's all designed for good for me. And um, I just thank you for that promise that's here for each and every person this morning as well. So just as we close... Um, I just pray that you would encourage the hearts of each person here, especially if there's things in their life which aren't looking as they would hope to look. And uh, they would just look to the next step they have to do in you, like, what is it that you're needing me to change to do in this situation? How, am I, how can I trust you better in this, Lord? How can I be at peace? How can I practice the fruit of the Spirit in the situation where I have peace and and joy in you, even in the midst while everything seems to be going wrong. Because the goal is me becoming like you, not the situation becoming perfect. Just commit that to you in Jesus' name. Amen.